Room 202, Double Booked. Written by J.R.H. Evil Inc. Narrated by Brandon Dayton. I wake up, fully clothed, staring at the ceiling. I have no idea how I got here. In fact, I have no idea where here is. Or, for that matter, who I am. As I wearily blink back to consciousness, I realize that there are only two things that I know for certain. One, this is a hotel of some kind. Nowhere but a hotel would be decorated in this forced clinical coziness, like a quaint lakeside cottage that's been prepped for surgery. Two, I had a very bad night. From the pounding ache in my skull, I can only presume that I either drank far too much, or an elephant sat on my head. I reach up to massage my throbbing temple. It's wet. Warm. I jolt upright and my world lurches in a dozen different directions. Bile rises in my throat. I'm not sure whether it's from the spinning sensation or the blood oozing down my fingers. It seems my pain isn't from booze. Something dealt a serious blow to my head. I look around for a mirror so that I can assess the damage, and that's when I see him sprawled out on the floor, dead. My heart stops. I leap from the bed and press myself against the wall. This can't be happening. I clamp my eyes shut, rub my face, take deep breaths. Nothing helps. When I open my eyes, it's still there. A body. A dead, fucking, body. His wounds are grotesque. Blood pooled everywhere. I didn't know people had that much. A dozen wounds, some exposing bone, show through the torn remains of an expensive red suit. No, not red. Gray. It soaked up so much blood I could only just see the original color. By the dead man's hand lies a shattered lamp, presumably from this room. My hand rises to my head unthinkingly. Is that the item that knocked me unconscious? If so, who was it that attacked this poor man? It takes me an eon, but I finally summer a quivering shadow of a voice. Are... Uh, are you alright? I needn't have bothered asking. I can see that he's riddled with deep puncture marks, blood having flowed out to coat the floor, the bed, and my clothes. It isn't flowing anymore. The stab wound to his neck probably saw to that. His pale face is turned towards me, and his glassy eyes are looking at my shins. I half expect him to flick up and meet mine, and I want to turn away, but I find that I can't. He looks so unnervingly familiar, though I can't place where I know him from. Then again, I can't recall my own name, so that's no surprise. But I'm certain that I recognize him from somewhere. That slim jawline, that pencil mustache, that swept back hair that refuses to stay in place, even in death. Yes, I know this man. Worse yet, I think I know his killer. A trail of blood leads from the body to the bed, and on the covers, within easy reach of where I woke up, is a glistening pair of scissors. Even in my clouded mind, there's no denying it. I'm the murderer. I don't remember doing it, but it must have been me. I attacked him, he struck me with the lamp in self-defense, we both collapsed, and only one of us woke up again. The realization strikes me in the gut like a hammer, doubling me over, bile in my throat again. I only just make it to the unsweet toilet before I empty my stomach inside. Little comes out, but I retch and retch, until my throat is burning and my lungs cry out for me to breathe. Then I retch some more. My hands quiver as I flush away the discolored water. All I can think of is that one word looping through my mind. Murder. 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 When my stomach is settled enough for me to get back to my feet, I stagger over to the mirror. As I draw my gaze towards it, I find the face of the dead man staring back at me. I scream and fall backwards. My hands claw at my face to disprove the lie that my eyes just told me. My fingers land on a slim jawline, run along a pencil mustache, clasp a mop of messy, swept back hair. I look through the door to the glassy-eyed corpse, then force my way up to the sink to check the mirror again. The corpse. Good God, it's 
me. I don't understand what I'm seeing, but my every sense tells me that it's real. My face is no mask, and after much hesitation, I confirm that the corpse's face isn't either. We have the same stature, the same eye color, even the same size clothes. Have I killed my identical twin? Do I have one? I add that thought to the growing list of things I can't remember, but even as I do, there's a feeling in the pit of my stomach that bristles at the notion. While this man being my twin is a rational explanation, it feels incorrect. Too easy. Too convenient. No. Without understanding how, I know that the dead body lying in front of me is, in every sense of the term, me. Grasping onto that fact as one of the only things that I know to be true, I calm myself and go over the steps that I need to take next. Get cleaned up, find out what's going on, hide the evidence, escape. Since cleaning myself up is the simplest of the list, I start with that. I wash my hands until all the blood is gone, and then I wash them a dozen more times. My eyes keep drifting to the mirror as if I expect that one time I'll look up and see a different face staring back at me. But it never happens. Each time I look into the mirror, I see the eyes of the corpse in the next room. My eyes. My corpse. The shirt and jacket I'm wearing are coated in blood as well. When it comes to escape, that might raise a few eyebrows. After several more minutes of deranged hand scrubbing, I search the bedroom for a change of clothes. I can only find a crisp gray suit hanging in the wardrobe, complete with shirt, tie, and shoes. It's disturbingly similar to the one being worn by the body a few meters away, but I don't have any choice in the matter. I replace my pinstripe suit with the fresh gray one, and after checking all the pockets of my old clothes and finding them empty, bundle the whole lot into the bin. With that task complete, I turn back to the corpse. Time to find out, if I can, just what on earth is going on. Mouthing an apology, I crouch down, avoiding stepping in the bloody spatters, and I rifle through his... my... the body's pockets. I find used tissues, a key labeled 202, presumably the room we're in, and finally, a wallet, which I tear open. Plenty of money, but no ID. Typical. It's just like to make murdering myself as confusing as possible. At least, I think it's like me. I shoot a look over each shoulder before pocketing the wallet, as if someone might have politely watched the murder, but be liable to leap out and intervene in a petty theft. I don't think I'd steal under normal circumstances, but after handling the wallet I realize that my fingerprints are all over it, so I, I can't leave it here. Besides, I might need the money to get away, at least until I can find out what's going on. Tucking the key next to my wallet, I decide to move on to the next item from the list. Hiding the evidence. A cursory glance around the room shows me that there's nowhere to stash the body in here, and certainly nothing that could dispose of it for me. A corpse-sized garbage chute would be ideal, but I concede to myself that such a convenience is unlikely to have escaped my notice until now. As a temporary measure, I settle on pulling off the bed sheets and bundling them over the body. If anyone popped their head into the room, they might not notice anything wrong, and that could buy me time for a more permanent solution. Satisfying myself that the corpse is as well hidden as possible with all the tools at my disposal, I psych myself up for leaving the room. It's a terrifying prospect, but I have to do it eventually. After a few minutes of approaching and retreating from the door, I manage to ease it open and peer through the crack. I'm relieved to see an empty corridor beyond. Of the dozens of identical, featureless doors, distinguishable only by their numbers, one at the end of the corridor catches my attention. It stands ajar, and I watch it as a mouse might watch a cat flap, ready to retreat at the first sign of life. None emerges. Nothing but discordant violin music passes through the hallway. Sensing my chance, I slip through and quickly close door 202 behind me, locking it and pocketing the key. With a pace that I hope suggests late for a meeting rather than fleeing a murder scene, I set off to the stairs, which are blessedly close to my room. I reach them without incident and trot down the first flight, meeting no souls in the stairwell either. So far, so good. 
As I pass the first floor, I see figures in the corridor. New arrivals, it seems. Marching up and down to find their room. I doubt they'll recognize me if they've only just arrived, but if I look half as suspicious as I feel, they might contact the authorities anyway. Wanting to avoid unnecessary attention, I continue down and emerge next to an empty reception desk. That gives me pause. I'm rather confident that no one spotted me on the way down. Now I'm standing opposite the hotel's exit, and no one's behind the front desk. I could walk out of here, and no one would even notice. They would check my room eventually, of course, and find the body, but by then I'd be long gone. My feet drag me toward the exit. My hand reaches for the door. I freeze. Where will I go? I try to summon to my mind a list of locations that a murderer might flee to. Concepts occur to me. A forest, a farmhouse, a cheap motel, like this one. But when I try to grasp any concrete details, they slip away from me. I try to picture any forest I've seen before. Any motel that I might head towards. Nothing enters my head. It's as though I've never experienced anything beyond these doors, and only heard of the outside world in passing. When I try to think of home, the only place I can see is room 202. I step back from the door. I can't escape into a world I know nothing about. I have to find out who I am, where I am, and what might await me beyond this damned hotel. Fighting the urge to avoid any signs of other human beings, I force myself to walk toward the nearest source of voices, which transpires to be the hotel bar. Unlike the second floor and the reception desk, it's full of activity. I scan the crowd for any faces that might prompt some recognition in my muddled brain, but unsurprisingly, I find none. Most of the guests ignore me, talking amongst themselves or glowering into their drinks. Those who do acknowledge me do so in the manner of a casual acquaintance giving a polite smile or a nod. No one approaches me, or invites me to sit with them. Seems I have no friends here. No enemies either, to my relief, or at least none who are making themselves known. Uncertain of how to proceed, I hover near the entrance, until a voice rumbles from behind the bar. Good afternoon, Mr. Crawford. I instinctively turn toward the speaker, I suppose that means I must be Mr. Crawford. It's nice to have a name for myself. Although the bartender who used it isn't the most comforting of individuals, he towers over me, eyes locked on mine, with a surgical mask obscuring most of his face. An unusual choice for a bartender. Perhaps it's a matter of health and safety. The next step up from a hairnet. Regardless, he's the first individual to demonstrate any knowledge about me. I approach the bar with a mixture of relief and trepidation, like a drowning man clasping for a life preserver that might be hiding a shark. You know who I am? I ask. The bartender inclines his head. I seen a lot of you in here, he says. Right, I say, of course. Um, this is an odd question, but do you remember how long I've been here? The bartender's cheeks wrinkle beneath his mask. I think he's smiling. You? he asks with an unusual inflection. You checked in yesterday, Mr. Crawford. I hope you've enjoyed your stay so far. I believe your preferred seat is over there. He gestures to a small table across the room. Yes, that does look like the kind of spot I'd choose. I open my mouth to interrogate the bartender further, but he interrupts me. What's your poison, Mr. Crawford? I pause. That's a very good question. I'm sorry, I say. I don't remember. Before I finish the sentence, a drink has appeared on the bar in front of me. A tall glass of amber liquid with ice and a slice of lime. I take a cautious sip. My taste buds explode, and the modicum of liquid that I sampled warms my throat as it goes down. I grin at the bartender. If this is my usual, then I have impeccable taste. Taking the man's advice, I navigate to my preferred table, where I sit and nurse my drink to make it last as long as possible. It truly is a great beverage. At times, I almost lose my worries in its smooth, refreshing taste, but I crash back to my paranoid reality every time a guest strays too close to my table. I feel like a hunk of meat thrown into a pen of tigers. They might not be interested yet, but 
sooner or later, they will grow hungry. To keep myself off the menu, I lock my eyes onto my glass, hunching up my shoulders to signal that I don't want to be disturbed. It seems to work, and I'm left alone to plan my next steps, at least until half an hour later, when my thoughts are interrupted. Good afternoon, Mr. Crawford, the bartender says. I turn, unsure why he's speaking to me from across the room, and my stomach falls through the floor. Opposite the bartender, oblivious to my presence, is a different Mr. Crawford. He's dressed in an immaculate pinstripe suit, the twin of the outfit I woke up in, and he looks as confused about his situation as I must have been when I first stepped into the bar. You know who I am? The other Mr. Crawford asks. The bartender inclines his head. We all know you here, Mr. Crawford. Only there was no one at reception, so I don't know. Room 202 has been reserved for you, explains the bartender in a louder tone than necessary. I get the uneasy feeling that he's addressing both of us. He continues, You requested a single bed with the view of the lake? That's right, says the other Crawford. Your room's being cleaned as we speak. If you wish to hand your luggage to the bellboy, it will be taken up for you while you wait. You'll find your keys inside. I'm so distracted by watching the second version of myself that it takes a few moments for the bartender's words to truly sink in. Room 202, my room, is being cleaned. Which means that they looked under the bedsheets. I gotta go, I hiss. I leap from the table and rush toward the stairs. As I approach the other Crawford, I pull up my collar and shrink into my suit. I wait until he's looking the other way before I move past him to the exit. I don't know what's going on, but I know that I don't want anyone else finding out that I have doppelgangers roaming around. New arrivals are waiting at reception, reminding me that my earlier option of a subtle escape has vanished. I hurry up the stairs, taking them three at a time, and burst into the second floor corridor. As I charge towards my room, a maid steps out and locks the door behind themselves. I nearly trip over in my attempt to avoid barreling into them. They barely notice me. Your room has been clean, Mr. Crawford, they say, eyes cast to the floor. They step around me and march down the corridor. My palms sweat. My mouth dries up. Before they vanish around the corridor, I call out after them. They freeze, their back towards me, and I wait for them to turn around. They don't. You... Did you, did you find... I stammer, struggling for the words. When I force myself to finish the sentence, I find myself saying, Am I in trouble? For a while, they didn't respond. The violin music from down the hall washes over us both, and voices mutter from a few doors down. Beyond the maid, a figure traipses up the stairs, stopping to check the nearest door number before continuing upwards. My heart won't stop beating inside my throat. Finally, in the same dead tone as before, the maid speaks again. Your room has been clean, Mr. Crawford. Without giving me chance to ask any further, they continue down the corridor and out of my sight. Is it possible that they missed the body? Surely not. I plunge my hand into my pocket, pull out the door key, and enter my room. I nearly collapse. Inside room 202 is a freshly made bed complete with complimentary chocolate on the pillow and a spotless carpet that emits a faint but pleasant lemony odor. No body, no blood, no scissors, no lamp. This room, without question, has been cleaned. As I inspect the carpet closer, determined to find even a single piece of evidence of the gruesome scene that was on display less than an hour ago, the strangest thought occurs to me. All this time I've been worrying about how to avoid getting caught for murdering myself, but now another me is wandering around, wearing the pinstripes I woke up in, and I'm wearing the gray that my own victim was murdered in. I've seen enough science fiction to know where this is heading. By the end of today, the other Crawford is going to stab me to death. Well, I have no intention of repeating my past mistakes, being the butt of fate's sick joke. I can't repeat the cycle if I know how to break it. All I need to do is take one element out of the equation, and it'll all fall apart. First, the murder weapon. 
I scour the room, checking every drawer until I finally come across them. The scissors. Clean, gleaming, sharp. I slip them through one of the loops in my belt. That's the murder weapon secured. Next, I need to remove myself from this room. If I don't ever return here, I can't die here. Simple. I stride to the door, reach for the handle, and pause as I hear my own voice from the corridor. Sorry, this is my room, and I'm eager to get inside. You can get the rest of your way all right, can't you? The other Crawford was right outside. If he hadn't stopped to talk, I'd have barged right into him. As I heard a female voice respond, I scanned the room in a panic. So, what brings you to this place? The stranger asks. I'm in the area for business, replies the other Crawford, and I couldn't pass up such a unique place as this. Finding no other option, I slip into the wardrobe and close the door after me. It's mostly empty except for a gray suit hanging up, with matching shirt, tie, and shoes. From the darkness inside, I listen to the rest of my, his, exchange. Well, thanks for helping with our bags, one of the women says. We really appreciate it. Not at all, replies the other Crawford. Happy to help. Then, the door to room 202 opens and closes. Footsteps approach. The sliver of light making its way into my hiding place flitters as the other Crawford walks past to inspect the end suite. Sounds of approval drift out, and the light flitters again. I place my eye against the slits of the wardrobe doors to get a better look at my potential murderer. He doesn't seem ready to kill. In fact, he spends several minutes staring out of the window at the lake beyond. Then he approaches the bed to test the comfort of the mattress. He has no idea what's going on inside this hotel. But I do. And as I watch him going about his business, a distant thought claws its way into my mind. There are three elements to the equation of my death. I already removed the weapon. I tried to remove myself. There's only one element to get rid of to ensure my own survival. I have to remove the murderer. When I see through the slits of the wardrobe that he has his back turned to me, I push open the door and jump out. He hears the noise and spins to face me, but I close the gap between us without a word. Good God, says the other Crawford. You're... you're me! The shock of seeing his own double makes him pause, and that's all I need. I reach out and grip his neck tight, squeezing with all the fury of a creature fighting its natural predator. His eyes bulge, his mouth sputters. Unable to make any sound but the faintest gurgling, his hands beat at my shoulders, my side, my skull, but I hardly feel them. Together we tumble onto the bed, and I use the extra weight to add pressure to my vice-like grip of his throat. I didn't count on having to watch myself die. As I see my own face turning purple and see pain tears streaming from my own eyes, I find myself crying too. I can't look at it any longer, but I can't stop. If I release him now, I'm done for. I maintain the pressure on his neck, but clamp my eyes shut and turn away. He rattles, writhes, pushes at me with fading strength. I grip my teeth, praying for this to be over. Then, agony slices through my gut. I scream and jump away. As my eyes open, I see the other Crawford gasping on the bed, wet scissors in hand. I stagger backwards, heart pounding. His own flailing hands must have landed on my belt and tugged the scissors free. I glance around for a weapon of my own, and in that brief opening, he lunges. I dodge the first swing, but the second catches my forearm, and the next my chest, and as the other Crawford presses on with his attack, he manages to sink his blades into my shoulder, hip, my stomach. I watch my own blood spray onto him, feel my pulse in every gaping wound. I stumble against the wall, and finally my hand finds purchase on something that I can use. With a desperate energy, I pull the lamp free from its table. I swing, he swings. We both hit our targets. My lamp smashes across his skull, sending him reeling. His scissors sink through my throat. Pain blooms as the cold metal slides through my neck. The other Crawford collapses on the bed, pulling the scissors with him. I sway on the spot. Try to speak. Try to cry out for help. Nothing but blood passes my lips. It's so warm. All over me. My blood is so warm. How is it that I'm so cold? The room blurs. Spins. I hear a thump as I hit the ground. Then, with a final gurgle, 
my world retreats to darkness. Absolutely fantastic story. 11 hours ago, it was posted, and only 27 upvotes? Oh god, it deserves so many more. Wonderful, wonderful story. Everybody loves a story about a doppelganger, or a skinwalker, or a haunted hotel. <laughs> and this one had all of the above, so definitely great work by J.R.H. Evil Inc. I will be adding him to my list of authors to keep an eye on. And I hope that you guys enjoyed the narration, of course. There's plenty of other narrations on my channel if you did, and I would appreciate if you checked them out. As always, I thank you guys for listening along with me. I've been Brandon Dayton, your humble narrator. This has been yet another No Sleep Creepypasta. I'll come back with another tomorrow for you guys, and I hope that you're looking forward to it as much as I am. I hope you guys will keep yourself safe until we meet again. So until then, friends, bye-bye.